Hey everyone, welcome to the Bold Patents Show. I am J.D. Hoovener, owner and founder here at Bold Patents Law Firm. I'm with here my trusty co-host, Matt Kolzap. Matt, good day to you. Good day to you too. Um, it's, it is Wednesday. We're here every Wednesday. For those that may have missed us, we're watching this after the fact. If you want to catch us live, we're here every Wednesday at 1.30 Pacific, 4.30 East Coast. Um, we're talking patents, trademarks, and intellectual property in general. And um, if, uh, if we can, we try to get some interesting guests on our show as well. So check that out. Um, but today you're going to have to be interested enough in just Matt and I. <laughs> We're going to try to make things uh, very interesting. I, in fact, today our topic is the riveting. <laughs> <laughs> you have cases of 2023. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, that's a, that's a barn burner. Let us just lean back in our chairs and endeavor in this venture um look as it turns out in my um actually i use chat gpt to like hey okay what are the what are the important cases to know did um, you did the answer for you unfortunately well you heard about that attorney right who submitted a brief to the court to a you know a state or, or federal court right and it used they used chat gpt and chat gpt is made of a bunch of like legal citations it's amazing. Of- it's amazing the only issue though uh, the first thing that, that I got a response back was, oh, whoops, sorry, ChatGPT is only updated as of 2021. So we're not yeah. able to provide anything as of 2023. Oh, shoot. Okay. So I went looking and poking around, and I did know of a couple of cases. This one we're going to look at today uh, was denied certiari from the Supreme Court, right, the highest court of the country. Um, but in a, in a denial, meaning, hey, we're not even going to actually look at this. There actually is some written opinion as part of that. It's a decision, right? You know, hey, are we going to really take this or not? It was denied. Cool. We're only going to look at one case because I think, I mean, there's a lot to talk about and unpack. And so that's what we're going to talk about here in the first segment. Um, before I do that, I want to make sure I, I don't forget to put my weekly live link in. Uh, I do it. So we have one live listener or viewer. Um, actually, three or four. Hey, cool. Um, I'm going to be looking at the comment box. We're live on YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook. So if you have any live questions, bring them on. I mean, anything goes. Patents, trademarks, if you're new, it's all good. No no question too simple um, or complex for that matter. Um, so we're going to be ready for it. Thanks for that heart. Um, Olivia, it's okay. You're late. No worries. So glad to have you. Um, and uh, again, we're going to prioritize those live questions. Um, keep them coming. So this first topic of the day of the day here is going to be all about a patent that was issued a long, long time ago in 2006. And, you know, it's actually pretty um, appropriate for this time of year. This is about travel, travel, mm-hmm. travel. Matt, have you done any traveling lately? No. On, a no, bus no, or, no just <laughs> on airplanes, we're talking about airplane travel. Well, we have done a couple trips. And what is the most painful part about an airline or going to the airport? I, I don't know. Uh, waiting in line. Security. Ding. Security. You nailed it. So this invention has to do with going through the TSA line. And what this invention is all about is it's a putting a specific lock, a mechanical lock, on your luggage that you otherwise want locked away from other people prying um, and allowing TSA a master key to be able to manual it, sort of a dual access lock, to be able to unlock it as needed to do their inspection. Um, and that is what the patent is. And I'm going to show this patent off because I know you're all excited to see the patent itself. Um, this was issued, like I said, a long time ago, 2006. So we're coming up on, uh, what, 13 years. Is that right? No. Shoot. Where's my math? Yeah, more than that, 20. Yeah, almost 20 years. Um, okay, let's look at this. 17, 20? I'm almost I've done a math problem. Okay, so here it is. Uh, the inventor's trop. Trop or trope? I'm, I'm not sure which way you'd go. It's David's yeah. out of New York, so. Um, yeah, method of improving airline luggage inspection. All right, and believe it or not, this is the patent that went up all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, David invented a method, a method, a method. Uh, so the, the abstract here for those you know, kind of lay person, for me, honestly, for a lot of folks that want to know, hey, what's this patent all about? This is the part of the front page that you go to look at is the abstract. Um, and it's kind of what I what I talked about. They, they talked about there's a lock. It's a special lock. OK, 
and it's got to be available to, um, you know, any traveler. It has a combination portion, right? Everyone's familiar with kind of the old school locker combination lock and a master key lock. So it's got this dual purpose. The special lock is designed to be applied to an individual piece of airline luggage and has an indicia, fancy word for just has wording on it that says this is special and it's been approved by the screening authority, right? One that we all know is the TSA. Hmm. Um, okay. And then they have access to a special lock can be opened using this master key, right? The TSA has the master key. It, uh, the method includes providing luggage screening authority with directly or indirectly with exclusive access to the master key. And the master manufacturers and providers of the key retain copies of it. So there it is. Looks like any old combination lock that's been around forever uh, to me, yep. but it's got this TSA approved kind of indicia, right? Sure. Okay. The actual physical lock, these are old school locks, right? Nothing's new about these things. Oh, yeah. No, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the lock picking lawyer would have those apart in 10 seconds. <laughs> right. No, this, these are secure, Matt. These aren't going anywhere. You, you're, you're putting your luck. I mean, hey, there's one of these on there. There's no way I'm trying to break in. Now, to find out what you own and what actually was argued here, you got to scroll down. So I'm making you guys dizzy, probably. I'm going to scroll back. So here it is. Claim number one. What is claimed is? This is a granted patent. Granted, that means it went through a full examination. An examiner went through it, looked high and low all over the world and said, yep, this method is unique. It's novel and non-obvious. We're going to grant this patent. You're the first inventor ever to describe a method like this. So it's a four-step method, uh, a method of improving airline luggage inspection, comprising. So it has to have at least these four things. Making available to customers a special lock marketing the special lock. I thought that was interesting, but marketing the lock to customers so they'll know what it's for. Identifying the lock. Whoops. Identifying the structure, signaling to a luggage screener that they've agreed to it, right? Basically saying, yep, TSA approved. And then step four, um, Using the key. <laughs> okay. Okay. You got get a lock. Let people know there's a lock. <laughs> All right. The third part, the third step is identify it. Yep. That's one of our locks. And then use the key to unlock it. Pretty straightforward. Pretty straight. uh -huh. So there was an issue. I'm going to give you, I'm going to go fast forward all the way to the Supreme Court decision. And and then, and then we're going to get into the detail a little bit. Um, I want to stop for questions at this point. Oh, here we go. Olivia's got a big thank you. I got to pull this up. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you. Uh, what made what made this get into my field of expertise? Are you inventors too? I have a lot of questions already. Is this the format for submitting a patent? Looks like an entire manual, right? I honestly thought we just needed to show the product we have, and that's it. Awesome, awesome questions. Okay, let's take those one at a time. I love invention. I love patents. I'm an engineer. Actually, I was uh, uh, an aerospace engineer first, and I got excited about innovation, worked for Boeing for 10 years, and helped design the 787 Dreamliner, the carbon fiber airplane. But kind of got tired of the big company thing, got tired of staying in a cubicle all day, and I said I want to go own my own company and do something to change the world. And so I decided to go to law school and do just that and open up gold patents in 2014. So um, kind of an entrepreneurial itch, not necessarily an inventor myself. I did invent a couple of things. Um, my daughter had uh, has really itchy skin when she was an infant and a child would itch and scratch to the point of bleeding. I actually invented this. <laughs> I, have, I have not heard this. <laughs> I invented and prototyped a, and I'm going to pull this up. I have to live uh -huh. a face shield, a mounted helmet face shield. So that she physically couldn't scratch her face. Oh, it's like a dog it's, collar for kids. Like a it's dog. Like, uh, it's like the cone of silence. Yeah. It's a, it's a really rough thing. I did submit it and did not elect to proceed with the non-provisional, <laughs> but because she grew out of it. But anyway, it's kind of out of necessity. Um, no, Olivia, you, you don't need to do 
all of that to get started. All you've really got to do is be able to have it in your mind or be able to write out a, a relatively succinct description of what your invention is or have some sketches. Give us a call and we'll take it from there. Usually the first step is conducting a patent search. The attorneys will draft a document like what I just had on the screen. So you don't need to be that far along. It's okay. Uh, David, daughter in the iron mask. Uh -huh. There you go. <laughs> love it. Love it. Yeah, I if I don't know if I have time. I will pull it up, I promise. You got to remind me. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I wouldn't share those photos on social media because, you know, you'll she'll regret it later. I know. No, no. Well, just my my ugly sketch of the invention. Oh, um, there you go. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, where were we? Okay, yeah, so this, this old patent talking about, you know, locks. Locks and dual-purpose locks. I have this somewhere here. Um, speaking of, like, really in-depth, nitty-gritty stuff, <laughs> let us dive into the Manual of Patent Examination Procedure, oh, Section man. 2106. That's I just want to show y'all what I had to study and learn. Okay, this is just one page of the diorama. Okay, this is the criteria for subject matter eligibility. <clears throat> all of this, and I won't make you read it all, and I won't read it out loud, talks about should an invention even be eligible for getting a patent? That's what all this is. Now, I, I'm a visual guy. <laughs> Let's jump to the chart. Now, this chart <laughs> is you guys get charts in uh in the patent examination world oh, man we don't get charts in uh you need tra charts. trademark manual examination procedure you guys Dude. are lucky Ooh. okay we'll get some stuff lucky the first part is <clears throat> you got to read the claims with the broadest reasonable interpretation and of course there's a whole lot of back and forth a lot of you know disagreement but once you kind of get this claim interpretation, this whole Markman procedure, uh, like I said, I'm not a patent litigator, but this is part of that, that whole part of it. As soon as you get into a, a litigation with respect to patent claims, you've got to go decide, hey, what does this mean, right? What does a special lock mean? You're going to have to get into identifying, you know, defining what a master key means. And all this will be defined and should be described in your specification. I won't go into too much on that. We're already at 143. See why I only did one example. Um, step one, is the claim to a process, a machine, a manufacturer, or a composition of matter? So in this case, a method is synonymous with a process. So you would say yes. If for some reason, <laughs> what you've invented is not one of these things, you just lose. Your claim is not eligible. Eh, you're out of luck, sorry. Um, the only issue is it, it, this really covers an enormous body of law, of, of subject matter, I should say. Um, it's hard to find things that aren't, honestly. So yes is a pre 99.999 of things are yes. There's this kind of subtle question of can it be streamlined? Is this something, you know, physical? Like if he was claiming the lock itself, you're just going to be like, whoop, yep, it's self-evident this is eligible it's a physical product it's eligible mm -hmm. right we're not looking at is this new we're not looking at whether this is non-obvious is it is it eligible is this clearly a process machine manufacturer or composition of matter done but if it's kind of murky at all then they'll proceed to step 2a is it directed to a law of nature a natural phenomenon or product of nature or an abstract idea okay and there has been a lot of case law around methods, 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 and processes that say, no, mm, they tend toward abstract. You can't actually see it and touch it. It's not tangible. And for that reason, they're most of the time will fall under this. Yes, it is an abstract idea. So the judges at the federal circuit said, yep, it's abstract. It's a method. It's talking about stuff that mm -hmm. happens um, in normal human activity. Then you go to step 2B, the second part here is, does the claim recite additional elements that amount to significantly more than the judicial exception? Okay, you've got to be able to add what's called an inventive concept. You have to, be able to add an, an additional element that's something technological advancement beyond everyday human activity. 
And the federal court, in this opinion here, said, no, there's not enough here. They were pretty brutal. So the district court where they heard everything, right? It was up before the jury, all the works, right? All the depositions, the evidence, the federal, sorry, the, the district court judge and the jury said, nope, this is ineligible. It, it fails this chart. And it, goes, it, is, it is ineligible. Okay. Gee, I'll, jump, I'll jump in really quick. So like, is this um, like a question of fact for the jury or is this a question of law for a judge in terms of these determinations? Do you, do you know how that breaks down in litigation? Pretty good question. Um, you know, if, if I was fresh out of the, my patent law class, I would know that. I don't know for certain. My heavy, heavy hunch is, is, a, is a question of law. Okay. Question of law. Yep. Things, uh, things related to infringement are usually questions of facts. Um, but this is about the law, interpreting the statute. So I, I am fairly confident it is this. Um, let's see here. All right. So let's jump back into the opinion. I know we're pushing our time limits, but this is cool. Um, share screen, opinion. I just want to get into some of the rationale for these judges. So this is the this is the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. So when you're playing in federal court, it goes from the district court all the way up to the federal circuit, right? The Court of Appeals, this is like way up there. There's no like state, you know, appeals court. It's the federal circuit. Okay. And the next step after that is the Supreme Court. There's only three tiers on the federal side for this type of thing. So we actually had two patents. The one I had pulled up was this one. This is the, a continuation. Um, they said the district court correctly held it ineligible. All right. The claim recites a method of making available to consumers a dual access lock. Marking it so that luggage screeners know they'll open it, agreeing with a screening entity. Um, right? Sorry about that. Um, it's the district court summarized the claim essentially describes the basic steps of using and marketing a dual access lock for luggage, luggage inspection, a long standing fundamental economic practice and method of organizing human activity. So they said there just wasn't enough. So, um, that, that sort of separate, an inventive concept beyond using a lock, a standard lock, no additional, they say it's special, but there's no additional details as to what makes it special aside from just the tagging. And of course, Mr. Trop argues that, um, you know, it's it's got this distinctive uh, mechanism, right? And it's this, this novel physical lock and, um, you know, he goes on to say the, the identifi identification structure and the improved physical components should be enough, um, but it just is not. The federal circuit says, no, we, we decline to to take that opinion, right? They're, um, they're saying that just wasn't enough to, to make it, to, to, to transform the physical object. So it's a bit of a bummer. And then so on, he takes it to the Supreme Court for certiorari to try to get them to uh, take this on. And they, they denied to take it. I don't think I have that Supreme Court um, certiorari case. But they said, no, the Federal Circuit was correct. Um, and this, this should have, you know, this is not eligible. Um, so it's interesting. It, it's a very careful case. It's like, okay, well, methods themselves are, are not necessarily altogether ineligible, but you've got to be able to show something beyond what you do every day. You know, the, so the, yeah, it just, it feels yeah. like reading those four instructions, right? Like how the process works, right? It just feels like they're stretching, right? Like yeah. if, you're, if you put some words on there, so now like the TSA agent knows that like, this is for them to open and like that you've given your consent for them to use their special master key. And it's like, dude, it's a, it's a padlock with a key, right? A key. <laughs> like that's it, right? right. Like that's nothing new about that. Yeah. It, right. Yeah. So I'm trying to think of ways that, you know, they could have made it eligible. Um, I know I'm just on air, just trying to give some time, but things like, ah, oh, let's see if they had made a, a specific type of key, right? That um, has you know, magnets on it, right? So the teeth would align or there's some identification or further analysis 
you know, where that where like maybe the the TSA agent has to badge in to using the key. And there's something that above and beyond uh, just using a key. That's that's a standard key. So you've got a little provo- and and David asked a good question here. Yeah. So this is way before you even get to novelty or non-obvious. This is just at the very very top, and that's why. I'm opposed to the way this opinion went down. Hmm. This is a method, right? Yeah. It's a new method. I like this inventor. I'm, I'm pro invention. If you didn't know, I mean, so this sucks. This really, really sucks because there's a lot of methods and processes out there for computer implemented inventions, for technological inventions, for very basic stuff to where doing those four steps. They've never, ever been done before. So to me, I believe that is at its heart eligible. Come on. Uh, Gee, but, when did when when was this opinion written? When was the federal uh, court? Uh, that, the federal decision. This was um, just thinking back to my law school days. Here we go, February twenty two, and then mm-hmm. it went. Uh, they went to uh, seek the Supreme Court and got denied just this month in May. May twenty twenty three was denied certiorari, and I thought I had it pulled up um, to share, but it must have gone away. Um. Yeah. Yeah, here it is. Yeah, court denies it. May 15th, petition for certiorari denied. Trope first travel century. Court declines to take up the petition uh, to overturn insular cases. Um, JD, is it your experience that process claims or process patents are somewhat more limited than they, they ever used to be? Do we see less of them? Ask that again. Just, uh, are we seeing less and less process patents? Are we seeing yeah, fewer? No, no, no. And, that, and that's, that's why this is such a rough decision not to take it. The Supreme Court should have taken it. We need to hear why more. Um, we need to understand what it is so we can help advise inventors on what more they need, right? Hmm. Uh, if, if a unique process or method isn't enough, what is right um they're, they're saying that inventive step and that is where it's just murky as all hell and and the problem with that is it is it gets into novelty why are we looking at novelty so early we shouldn't be talking about hey you don't have to have magnets you don't have to show off like what the technical solution is it, it is a method it's a process and the examiners did their job and found that no one's ever documented or published that before you, that inventor deserves to get that patent. So it's a real shame. So did, the, it, did they even do, did the exam, the examiner at the USPTO even do like the full examination or do they just get to this? You know, oh, no. Oh, this, this got fully examined. Oh, oh it did. Okay. Yeah. So there was some okay. assigned an examiner. They went and did, they searched all over the world. And they said it's non obvious. This yeah. is like, this is non obvious. This is in the private supervisor. Yeah. Granted patent. And huh. back in 2006. And so it's been enforced for 10, 15 years. All of a sudden, they go to try to enforce it again. I was going to say, like, what's the story, right? They must have tried to enforce it. Of course. Oh, yeah. So this travel safe company pops up. They start using a lock. They start infringing on the patent. So the the rightful patent owner says, hey, I'm going to sue you. Please cut that out. And they say, no, I'm not even going to argue. I'm not infringing. I'm going to say this is ineligible. And that's what happens a lot of the times is you'll get in a fight about eligibility first. Before we can talk about how we're not infringing, I'm going to kill your patent by by arguing it's invalid. Just malarkey. We had a question coming in from Libby. We're not going to get to our shark tank. And that's perfect. So if we have a method that is unique to my small business, and I'm confident in it because even though it seems so obvious, not one agency has implemented it. What template should I use to present it to you in a consultation? Um, goodness, I would say write it out or just have it, have it come prepared to, to tell us what it is. Um, you know, and, and and we can help you from there. So I, I don't, you know, no no need for templates or to overthink it. If you want to have us consider and help us help you think through eligibility, <laughs> patentability uh, of the process or the method you have, um, schedule and click that link up above and schedule a free session for doing that. I'll give you a copy of my book here. Um, the the thing about methods and processes, and and this is part of what we deliver in our patent search opinions is, hey, look, we will say, yes, based on our search, you know, we put ourselves in the examiner's shoes. We think we can get you a patent on this. Inventors need to think hard about that because it, it could cost 15, 20 plus grand to go acquire and get this patent in your name. 
<clears throat> detectability and enforcement of methods is the most challenging, right? For example, if you have a method or an internal process of how your business works, how you deliver your goods or services, it is awfully hard sometimes, I would say with most methods or processes, to spot a competitor using that same method without actually being in-house and seeing what they're doing. And so oftentimes it, it makes sense to keep those methods and systems as trade secret because they're, they're just not known and they're very hard to detect and enforce a patent. Of course, that's something we can help you uh, think about and answer. Uh, there's plenty of methods and processes that get patented because the way they want to go to market, they're not keeping it in house. They may want to license or sell it in terms of software or sell a computing or hardware good that comes with that and explains how the method works. In that case, if you're going to be going public with it, don't keep it as a trade secret. You want to secure it as a patent. So a lot of different ways to go about that. Um, anyway, so we spent a lot of time on that. I wanted to get to our bold bite, uh, but we'll have to get to that next time. Um, what I want to do now is maybe go to a couple questions that came in on Avo, unless you have a follow-up thought or two, Matt. No, I am thoughtless. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to put you on the spot then. I, I have one trademark question that popped up over the week. This is, uh, this is out of the Boston area. I won't, I won't do I won't do my Boston accent. <laughs> Tempting. Here we go. Okay. Is the name Aspirin trademark protected in the U.S.? Can I use Aspirin as a product name or as part of the product name in the U.S. or will that violate a trademark? Ooh, that is like very specific. I can't wiggle out of this one and say, well, it depends. <laughs> uh, you could say, hey, for a confidential console. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, that is a really good question. Um, is Aspirin a federally registered trademark? Hold on. Let's. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that is. This is live. Let's this do live. this together. I, you know what? I've never considered that. You know, um, you know, like Tylenol is obviously a brand, right? It's uh, the trademark for the products or the drug. Yeah. Them, right. And so I'm curious. Amen. Aspirin, I think is aspirin's aspirin, isn't it? Isn't I it don't know. I uh, I don't know. That's a that that gets. Right. Yeah. So let's do this. Let's do. Let's what is up. in aspirin? What is in aspirin? How about that? Yeah, I. Oh, uh, here it is. <laughs> salicylate, salicylate. So that sounds more like a chemical term. So it's all right. Let's uh, let's do this. Let's run a quick search at the USPTO. We're going to look up the mark aspirin in class five, which is the pharmaceutical class for pain relief medication. That's where this one should be registered. Um. Interesting, interesting, interesting. There are many registrations owned by many different companies that use the word aspirin. So is aspirin a registered trademark? Yes, but if it's owned by so many different companies, my thought process is if I did some more research is that aspirin would be considered generic. That's probably why it's being used that way. Hmm. Call me. <laughs> we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll look into this a little bit more. This could be a, yeah, I appreciate you, you, you not, not jumping to an answer. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's interesting because time. it, it yeah. sounds to me like it, it was a brand at some point in my mind, you know, but there's so many registrations for like, I see uh, theanine, aspirin, aspirin for life, um, naspirin. Uh, number one cardiologist recommended aspirin. Um, so whenever you see that, um, <clears throat> like number one cardiologist recommended aspirin in a trademark, and they have to disclaim the word aspirin, it's <clears throat> because typically the word is descriptive of, of the product, right? So either it's descriptive or has been previously ruled by the USPT, USPTO to be generic for the thing that it is. It's right. kind of like escalator, moving staircase, clean exit. There we go. So, okay, got it. So if, if it's similar to escalator, if I wanted to start, you know, um, electric escalator company. Called aspirin? No. <laughs> I mean, we'd have to do a search on that. I mean, you never know. No. Oh, man. Aspirin for the inventor or, you know, inventor's aspirin. 
uh, with, for a long term. Right. Yes. You, could, you could probably you could probably do something like that, assuming of course that um, you know the aspirin wasn't really you know two metrics aspirin wasn't merely descriptive just specifically for inventors. Right. It might be merely descriptive. It might get a two e refusal there. Okay. Um, but yeah, I guess for the, the the potential client here, what are they interested in? You know, registering aspirin for right would be the question, right? Because we know we can probably register in class five because it's generic or you know um, for the thing that it is. But you know, if you're trying to register the word aspirin for use on escalators, you know, then you got to look in a different class. There you go. There you so. go. So Matt said, "Give him a call. Let's do that." <clears throat> if you have further questions and you want to get with Matt, here's your link. You're going to get a free book. You're going to get a chat with Dallas Richardson, our superstar client success manager, and ask about ask for Matt. And you'll get connected to Matt with that link right there. And that'll tell him that you found us on our weekly live. Cool. Matt, we're at the end of our time. We're going to wrap up. That was fun. I, I learned something. Good. Yeah, actually, I, I did too. You know, as you're teaching, one of the best ways to learn. Yeah. Uh, for, about, for me, Matt and Bold Patents, we're out. We'll see you guys next Wednesday at 1.30 Pacific. Take care, everybody. Go big, go bold.